as we are now in the year 2023 and we're hearing rumors about a recession and lots of things that may make us a bit anxious, it's good to have a couple of friends who want to improve your health care coverage at a lower cost. I love it. We're with Tom Masney and also Rob Lamberts. Now, which of you are the former Major League Baseball player and which is the doctor? That's what I want to know. Uh, do not call me a doctor. <laughs> okay, no problem. Uh, Rob is uh, uh, with Welcome Health. And, and Rob, when did you uh, form Welcome Health with uh, your partners? Well, actually, Welcome Health formed just this past year. Um, I have actually, this is actually coming up on my 10th anniversary of going independent, of going rogue in the healthcare system, as it were. Uh, but I, uh, uh, but it will be only one year. Actually, it was in sept- uh, August, actually, that we, that we uh, formed Welcome Health officially. And the uh, tall right-hand side armor, Tom Masney is the former baseball player with the Cleveland Indians. And how many years ago did you get started in the employee benefit world and, uh, and share with us your company and uh, how you try to serve? Yeah, so I appreciate that, Neil. Um, I started in the employee benefits arena in 2012. Um, my entry was with ADP more on the payroll side, um, but that led into the human capital management side of things, uh, more from a technology standpoint, but an interaction with employee benefits consultants while I was trying to uh, sell them technology. But that led into me falling in love with insurance and employee benefits. Uh, Moved here in 2014 and uh, have been here ever since working on controlling costs for them employers in the CSRA. Uh, The pennant group was formed a little over a year and a half ago uh, by me going independent as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, haven't looked back since steadily looking forward into how we can control costs in the CSRA. And you brought uh, Rob with you. Um, How do the two of you sort of complement one another? Yeah, I think we're looking at controlling costs, right? And ultimately, costs and procedures and claims is what drives up health insurance premiums. So if we can get out in front of that and get data um, and have, per se, a quarterback, which is how I view primary care, it's kind of the quarterback of health insurance and claims and and employees' health, um, then we can ultimately drive down costs. So um, I have created a partnership with Rob and his team just to uh, get, get behind the employees and help the employers um, control their costs of the claims, which ultimately control their premiums. And uh, full disclosure, uh, I've been a member of Welcome Health, and uh, every time I go to sit down to read the magazine, someone up front says, okay, we're ready for you. I mean, I haven't had to wait. Yeah. So to me, that's the number one benefit because the first rule of business is time is money. Absolutely. And yeah. and from my standpoint, um, one of the radical changes that we made uh, with with the direct primary care welcome health uh, is is the method of payment. How you are paid will determine a lot of how your business runs. And so, um, you know, a lot of the broken things, and I think we're going to go into that in a little bit. Um, some of the broken things are the fact that that the payment system is so messed up in healthcare. Um, and if you just tweak that in certain ways, it can it can greatly improve not only the cost of care, but also the quality of care and just the whole nature of the the interaction with healthcare uh, workers with with the healthcare community. And so that's why it's important for us to find a um, somebody on the insurance side who is interested in controlling cost and being creative uh, from that standpoint and not just embracing that system that is basically ruining healthcare in the mm. United States. And before we delve into a lot of the specifics, I know both of you have robust websites because it can be not confusing, but just very uh, detail oriented about various services. What are each of your websites? Uh, my my website is thepennantgroup.com, um, and uh, we are updating that constantly uh, with articles and uh, creating a site with partnerships. So as we both evolve, we can uh, point 
employers, employees in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And our website is welcomehealth.net. Okay. And Rob, you mentioned uh, you've you've gone rogue. Um, In your past life, when you were part of the system, did you uh, work at any local hospitals or have privileges? Did were you involved at all? Yeah, we were. Um, I I was a part of a uh, uh, independent fee for fee for service type of group, a, a typical primary care group. In fact, I was one of the founding members. Um, but the um, the care that we gave was in conjunction with hospital care and and I had hospital privileges early on we would even do hospital rounds for adults and pediatrics and as time went by and the whole hospitalist movement uh, came about um, I I pretty much stopped doing Mm -hmm. inpatient care um, altogether and Tom I know that you very closely monitor the market and what is going on in with the hospital space in the CSRA yeah so so you know, I want to bring up uh, a couple of things. One is insurance is not a, a se- sexy topic to talk about, right? It's not a uh, not a very exciting topic. Um, it's a very confusing topic. Uh, most employers don't understand it, and employees don't really understand it. Um, so, what we're trying to do at our our agency is uncover those hidden costs. So, what's really truly driving healthcare premiums and costs for employers? Um, our market, the CSRA, the 23 surrounding counties, um, we have been a very good place for care. We've had a lot of competition from um, locally owned um, physician practices and hospital systems um, where they dictate the cost of care for the most part. Uh, we've been sheltered. We've been, luckily for the last uh, you know, time being 20 years, we've been very sheltered. Well, yeah, because... Uh St. Joseph's Hospital, University, mm-hmm. uh, Medical College of Georgia, and it's it's all very recently just kind of changed. Right. It, it's it's changing on the hospital side, but it's also starting to trickle down and mm-hmm. and change on the independent provider side. Um, there's something called a vertical integration, and mm-hmm. I think I've talked about that a little bit on previous podcasts. But vertical integration is happening not only on hospital systems side, but also on the insurance side. And when both of that happens, we create kind of a perfect storm where prices keep rising and premiums keep rising. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And it's what's hidden behind that is what we're trying to uncover and control, and that's going to be the claims. And, of course, it ends up uh, cost of care. How is it that with your business model – you're able to make things much more affordable than if I just try to go to the doctor, the, you know, and, and like we used to do for decades. Well, that I can, I could talk for at least an hour about that subject, about the ways in which we can, we can lower the cost of care. Um, but I do think what I would first just touch on is the importance of what Tom was talking, the idea of independent um, physicians uh, uh, or medical practices that are taking care of you, um, especially in primary care, because there is a um, mistaken idea that doctors and hospitals are on the same team. Um, and and honestly, if if I'm utilizing, if I'm owned by a hospital um, in the care that I'm giving, I am motivated and even financially incentivized, and certainly, you know, the hospital wants me as part of their team, mm-hmm. not because they want me to keep people healthy. I mean, that's the bottom line: is they want me to be a feeder, even a lost leader if necessary, mm-hmm. somebody who can feed their hospital system. Uh, and if I'm feeding the hospital system with with um, people in the hospital, people go into the emergency room, people utilizing specialists. To some extent, as a primary care doctor, I'm failing at my job. I'm not preventing those diseases. I'm not handling them well. Um, and, you know, the worst job I do as a clinician, the more money the hospital makes, <laughs> which is why you need independent primary care. I see my job as playing defense against the hospital, 
against the hospital system. And so it's really, really important to maintain that independence. Yeah, and, and I'm going to jump on top of that and dive a little bit deeper into what's happening in our market, right? So across the country, when we look at independent uh, providers versus hospital-owned providers, right? So outside of our market, um, the national average is 74% of physicians are now owned by a hospital mm-hmm. system, mm-hmm. right? So to Rob's point, they're incentivized to drive uh, procedures through the hospital system. Let's get those procedures done at the highest cost of care, which is the hospital themselves, right? But in our market here, um, we are basically reverse, right? We are 74% independently owned today. So we're in a market where we as um, employers and independently owned physicians have an opportunity to really create something different, to really control where procedures are done, um, ultimately controlling the costs and being better consumers, right? So, you know, what has happened over the last year and a half, uh, Piedmont has come into our market and taken over University Hospital. Okay, our cost of care in our, our market, um, everything is based off of Medicare, Medicare being the baseline 1.0, the cost of claims, 1.0 Medicare is our baseline. Uh, University Hospital um, and our average in our market was about two times Medicare, which is extremely low across the country um, in reality. With Piedmont coming into our market, they're going to bring their pricing. That's They're an 18 hospital system, um, mostly in metropolitan areas, which the cost of living and the cost of care is is a lot higher. So I'd say three to four times Medicare is, is uh, where they sit. Mm-hmm. Um, we just now recently heard that Wellstar is now in process of potentially entering our market, right? They're doing their due diligence. And with that comes higher pricing as well. So what does that all mean? That means that, you know, doctors that are aligned with those hospital systems are now going to drive up the cost through that system And ultimately, claims will cost more because the claims reimbursement from Medicare is higher in those metropolitan areas. And if their pricing is coming here, we're going to go from two times Medicare to four times Medicare. Um, So let's just say a knee surgery that was $10,000 is now going to cost $20,000, $30,000, $40,000. And ultimately, the end employers through their premiums are paying those costs. Mm, yeah. And I would emphasize that, that that increase in cost does not mean that the physicians are making any more. In fact, typically in those types of hospital systems, those, those physicians will make less or at least stay even. So all of that extra cost goes to administrative. It is not into improving care. And we're continuing with uh, Dr. Rob Lamberts from Welcome Health. There are several direct pri- primary care offices uh, in the CSRA, and we'll talk a little bit more about the services and who the doctors are involved with Welcome Health, and also Tom Masney, who um, runs the Pennant Group, and as he mentioned, tries to drive down the cost of insurance. Um, so I am, I'm guessing, as you mentioned, this is a, a real trickle down. We're not going to see our our monthly Blue Cross and Blue Shield, or you know, pick pick a name of mm-hmm. uh, of, of an insurance carrier, it's not going to go down. It won't go down, and it hasn't been going down for the last, uh, you know, I'd say ten years, yeah. right? Since the enactment of the Affordable Care Act, premiums have gone through the roof, right? Um, and we're seeing that uh, hospital prices on their stock prices have gone through, and insurance carriers have been the ones that have benefited the most. Um, as I, I stated, we are a unique market here that we have an opportunity to kind of change the game, right? Being mostly independently owned physician groups, um, we can get out in front of it, maybe through some direct contracting with local providers, um, creating products that are locally sited here. Um, so our claims are based off of the employers in our market. Um, but, you know, as we talk about what, my role is in insurance. I can sell 
insurance or we can really control costs and try and control costs and what's driving that. And that's ultimately what, what I'm trying to do. And I think ultimately what, what Rob and his group is trying to do is become a quarterback for the employees and their members, which will ultimately control, control the claims and control the costs. Um, it's no different really than using your baseball career, your baseball career. It's, it's like a coach really. Exactly. Exactly. It's what we've come to realize in our market um, and with our clients is about 2% of the population drives 80% of the costs. How so? Well, you have a lot of people that are unchecked that don't want to go to the doctor. I'm, I'm prime example of that. Oh, right? I'm a gotcha. 41 year old male who seems healthy. Um, I don't want to go to the doctor because it takes time. Time is money, as you pointed out. And it costs a lot of money for me to go to the doctor. Um, insurance or health, the healthcare system is the only system that I know of that you don't know what the cost of care is until mm-hmm. after Afterwards. you get a procedure. Right. 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 Like if you're going to buy a car or you're going to buy a TV or I'm getting work done on my wife's car right now, I know what that cost is going to be. Right, because it's laid out. I can go and say, "Hey, what the cost of this TV is fifteen hundred dollars." Then you make a decision of whether or not you want to buy it or not. Well, healthcare is the only system where the doctor says you need this done, and you're going to do it here, and you say okay. And then thirty days later, you get a, a a bill or a breakdown of what it truly costs. You didn't know that going into it. But I, all I know is I would not buy a TV or a car or any widget if I didn't know what the cost was. Right. But people are doing it all day long in healthcare, and and that is actually one of the things. And again, I'm going to spell out exactly how we do it. But predictable pricing and predictable understanding what everything is going to cost ahead of time, and being able to predict your your costs over time from a business standpoint. You know, we're 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 I've been doing it, doing actually direct primary care for about 10 years, and the majority of time it's been with individuals. But one of the reasons we formed Welcome Health was to more focus on businesses and the ability to control the cost for the businesses and give them predictable, uh, predictable cost of uh, for high quality care. Uh, and again, I can. But, but what we found was that as we pitched that, and everybody will say, that sounds great, but what happens if I go to the specialist? What happens if I go to the hospital? Uh, and that's where having a partner who can do the same sort of thing using, using various, uh, um, various transparencies, I guess I would say, um, it, it's essential for me and for us to be able to build something that is appealing to businesses on the whole side because the majority of their cost to some extent comes on the, um, that, that 2% who, who will utilize, um, the emergency room who will spend two weeks in the hospital or because having not taken care of their blood pressure. So, so they're making bank on 98% of us, I suppose really. And, uh, again, uh, Rob's website is welcomehealth.net and Tom's is the pennant group.com. So, um, I guess the big question uh, for you, Tom is how do you actually control healthcare costs? Well, one is getting the data, right? I think okay. decisions are made by data. Right, and data drives decisions, and any good employer uh, will make a proactive decision based on data that they've accrued over time in the past, right? Um, so ultimately, my company is trying to help employers, um, I guess, level off the cost of their insurance and get out in front of it, become proactive versus reactive, um, and finding cost containment solutions is key to that. And, and if... Uh, the easiest place for me to find data and get out in front of it is the entry point of care. And that's where primary care physicians come in, come in play. In my opinion, a primary care physician is, is the most important person in the healthcare arena, right? They're the first person somebody sees when they have an issue or when they're just doing their well care uh, checkups. And then ultimately, if we can put in a good primary care practice at the baseline and they can help educate 
and um, tell that employee what's going on and where to go and be essentially their quarterback of care, Mm -hmm. uh, then we can get out ahead of the cost. So that's ultimately why I found Rob and and their, their group and why I love the concept of direct primary care is because it's not, uh, it's not difficult for an employee. Um, It's not difficult for an employer to have the service, but really an employee, it's not uh, financially taxing on them. Um, The costs aren't hidden. They're transparent. Mm -hmm. They know what they're getting. And ultimately they're putting another team member in place to help them navigate this complex system that is hidden. Right. So I'd love for, for Rob to just explain what direct primary care is what it's also called in different markets, but really what the concept is and why um, it's a newer concept in our market, but it's not a newer concept, right? I mean, yeah, I, I, to some extent it steals from the, the whole um, capitation HMO model Mm -hmm. to some extent, because that's what we're doing. Um, uh, You know, direct primary care is um, focuses really on two things. Number one, the direct side of things is that um, direct primary care practices are not paid by insurance. Um, primary care, primary care doesn't need to be insured because truth is we don't do anything that's expensive. When you when you have your car, do you have insurance for your oil changes or for routine maintenance on your car? I no. just pay as I go. Right, you pay actually, as you go. And I budget for it. It seems reasonable to Correct. me. Correct. And if, if nothing that I do will cost over much over a hundred dollars, save maybe vaccinations. So that would be the one thing area that primary care, but even then it's not like we have a $10,000 charge for something like a, like a, an orthopedic surgeon or an ophthalmologist mm-hmm. might do. Um, it's, it's very low cost. So first off, if we take away that insurance middleman, uh, then we suddenly shrink the equation down and we can talk about what stuff actually costs um, us and then turn around and run the business efficiently. Um, and, and that's where the second component of, of uh, direct primary care comes in. And that is rather than paying on a fee-for-service basis where somebody comes to the office and they pay me for the service I render there, I am offering access to our system. I am offering access to primary care to all of our patients for a set fee every month. And before people say, oh, yeah, I've heard about that concierge medicine, that VIP medicine, which is basically something highly, a very high cost that you can add on to uh, for basically wealthy people uh, who can afford extra special care. Um, this is actually averages around $60 a month, depending on the age. Um, and uh, as people get older, their utilization goes up. And truthfully, the reason that we tiered it with age uh, is actually more to attract the the younger folks because they're not going to utilize nearly as much in general. And yeah. so we want to have people who are in their 30s who have high blood pressure who are able to get that taken care of and not have to worry about the cost of that or people or to diagnose diabetes earlier or to to help people take care of their their obesity. So those types of things that we we lay out. I mean when we flipped those two things around, it was radical in the type of care that we could give for people, as you've experienced, actually. And we have, Rob, uh, a nine-year-old daughter, Lindy, and, and she does not get sick very often. But, you know, the flu was going around the last few months, and what I thought was just so neat, and she's been in to see – Davis Mellick and and Evans at one of your offices and he takes great care of her and you know she's been swabbed before for COVID and you know when it's real important but in that case we we went on to an app Mm -hmm. that I think it's called the Spruce app and 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 then we had a nice dialogue back and forth I mean what doctor in town does that? Takes the time to actually listen to what you have to say, ask questions about the symptoms, and then make a recommendation and save us time. Right. You know. and, and there and that's not and I will to the to the business folks out there, they're gonna say, Well, 
that's dumb business. Why don't you bring them in? Well, that's the whole point of our business model being turned around because I'm not answering questions um, to people via Spruce, via text messaging or, or offering, um, offering care that is, is less of a pain in the neck um, because I'm a nice guy. I'm doing it because actually it's best for my business. Truthfully, if you're paid on a monthly basis, well, then I don't have to worry about bringing people into my office to make money. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I like to say there, there are four motivations in a typical primary care practice from a financial standpoint, from a business standpoint. Number one is that they bring you in for every little thing. Um, you know, whatever issue. Mm -hmm. uh, the second is that they, um, the second is that, that you are as sick as possible. Uh, you know, the sicker you are, the higher bill code that they can do. The third is that they do as many procedures on you as they possibly can because you get paid by procedures. And the fourth is that they spend as little time with you as possible. None of those None of those are what our patients want, and none of those are conducive to quality care. The truth is, access is far more important. The fact that our patients, I had one, one young guy said, I got a freaking doctor in my pocket all the time. It's great. Uh, and, and the fact is that if I can handle flu, which you don't necessarily need to come into the office to handle a lot of these things. In fact, I found that three quarters of the care that I was seeing in my previous practice before I left and started doing this, that three quarters of it didn't require an office visit. So if I can cut those office visits way back, well, guess what? A bunch of things happen. Number one, I don't have as many patients in my office, which is nicer for me. Uh, number two, um, that suddenly I have availability in my schedule that if you do need to come in, you know that we offer pretty much same day things. If you call in the morning or send a message early on, we can handle things right away. So, so it's really offers that there's zero wait times for that reason. Um, and, and the quality of life and the quality of care and the time that we can spend with patients, all of that is goes up. Yeah. And it, I'm just going to jump on and say, why is that important on insurance, right? So you brought up a point, concierge versus direct primary care. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm, I'm wrong on this, but direct primary care, to Rob's point, does not utilize insurance, right? If, there, if he as a quarterback says, hey, you need to have an MRI, he will actually refer them out to a quality center that may be low cost, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can use your insurance, right, for those. But ultimately, concierge physicians are still utilizing insurance. True. So you're paying a, a monthly fee to have access to this physician, but then the procedures that they're running and the tests that they're running are running through your insurance. So ultimately, we're not controlling any costs, no. right? You have access to them, which is wonderful, but they're still driving up your cost because they're running procedures, maybe unnecessarily. I mean, I don't, I don't know uh, if they're getting compensated on procedures, mm -hmm. but ultimately you as a consumer, all you have is a, a copay, right? You, you just pay $50 every time you see them and then they run all their tests and you, you get an EOB behind the scenes that says you owed $50, but these are all the tests that ran and this was a, the cost. Well, all that cost hits your insurance in your claims, which ultimately affects the employer's premiums. So the beauty of direct primary care is if they're not running it through insurance, they're still getting the data and they can communicate what is going on, but we're not filing claims, which is ultimately lowering costs of care behind the scenes to the employers. And of, and of course, uh, Dr. Lambert's, you, you cannot help with catastrophic care, but either can physicians in a normal practice. But there's a lot of things that you can oh, yeah. do that are surprising. I, I, it surprised me. Well, catastrophic care, I can prevent pre catastrophic care. Yeah, sure. In other words, if, if, somebody, if somebody, you know, like Tom, has, has high blood pressure, has, has diabetes, or has, has other chronic conditions, has asthma, or even stress and anxiety-related problems, which, I mean, pretty much most of us 
in 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 the year 2023, uh, especially when we're talking about health care costs. Is that when I take my happy pill? That is, that, is exactly is that it. That's okay, why I'm you should checking. keep taking your happy pill. Yes, sir, I will. Um, no, that 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 people don't get the care because number one, it's a pain in the neck. You go to the doctor, you wait an hour, and then you get five minutes of their time and you don't feel like you're getting the care you want. Number two, it's just uncomfortable going into the doctor's office in the first place. And number three, you're not going to know what it's going to cost. And it's so could it cost, you know, $200 to go see your primary care doctor? Yeah, it could. Um, In our group, it's already paid for. And so we, you know, people are far more likely to come in. And when they do come in, I'm far more likely to give our, I mean, our average office visit is half an hour long. Yeah. Um, the normal office visits are half an hour long. For new patients, I give them a whole hour just to sit and talk and for them to get to know me and me to get to know them. And again, it sounds too good to be true. People say, well, what's the catch? And it's like, the catch is you pay me every month. But on top of that, we offer inexpensive medicines. We try and save money on medications. We try and save people money on 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 um, lab tests that we can do through our office, and we've negotiated cheap fees. Mm-hmm. And why do we do that? Because we're so nice. No, we do that so you keep paying the monthly payments. Right. Um, and and with small businesses right now, we're looking into something called Nonagon, which is kind of a cool thing, and this would work with families as well. But it's a little device that allows you to look in the throat, look in the ears, listen to the heart, listen to the lungs, um, you know, put in vital signs and that type of stuff and basically do a virtual visit. Mm. Well, imagine a family with a bunch of kids having that at home or imagine a family, a, a business being able to have a unit at their office that they would be able to have employees instead of going into the doctor's office, they could use this device to do a virtual visit, whether it's real time or whether it's it's um, you know um, uh, where where they record it and then we view it later asynchronous I think is the term mm-hmm. um, and and you know that's to the benefit of employer uh, employers are keeping their employee uh, employers are keeping their employees in the office rather than having them spend two hours at the doctor's office for five minutes of the doctor's time so I mean it's really once you know I've been doing this for 10 years and it is still, you still see the expression on people's faces when they come into the office of like, why isn't everybody doing this? It works so well. And that's a good question. I, you know, that's a probably a different podcast. <laughs> yeah. So you brought up a good question of, you know, how does he get out in front of a catastrophic claim? Mm-hmm. Right. Well, um, back when the Affordable Care Act was enacted, they put in what's called preventative care procedures that have to be covered at 100%. So everybody's aware, you know, you get a wellness checkup every year that's covered at 100%. doesn't cost you anything. Um, But they're putting these procedures in traditional insurance for a reason, that if you see a physician, right, on a regular basis, you will ultimately prevent something from happening. But if it goes unchecked, Mm -hmm. then it's going to turn into a catastrophic claim. But for me... Um, is my premiums keep going up and my household budget keeps getting increased and my pay is not going up as fast as my, my bills, right? So if I have a health insurance plan that um, does not incentivize me to go to the insur- or to the provider, right? So if my copay is $100, but I can't afford that, I'm just going to go without seeing it, and that's going to go into a catastrophic claim. Mm-hmm. So if I can put in a program like Welcome Health that can be paid by the employees or be paid for by the employer, and it doesn't cost that employee anything to go see them, and I can get in quicker, mm-hmm. and then I can call them, I can text them, I can see them whenever I really need to, and he's not financially incentivized to just churn and burn. Right, right. right? I can get out in front of a catastrophic claim. Right, because with a business, if if we're teamed up with Tom and we're able to save money and, and they've done studies on, on direct primary care compared to a typical fee for service, and there is substantial cost savings, you know, 25% reduction in emergency room visits and those types of things. Mm-hmm. I don't know the exact numbers, but they're in that range of, of substantial cost savings. Um, and health 
benefits to the employers uh, and employees. The idea is, from my business standpoint, I want to do all that stuff as best as I can because I want businesses who are supporting. And, and the goal, the ultimate goal of Welcome Health is to start planting direct primary cares uh, practices around the CSRA. I would like to have small practices still, still with that mm -hmm. feel, not of, you know, 20, 20 practitioners in the same building, but, you know, no more than six. And really, if we can keep it down to four uh, in an office uh, and, and put them in, in the, you know, in Aiken and Waynesboro mm. and Thompson and Lincolnton. And, and, you know, it doesn't take many, uh, many patients to support a direct care practice. I have 800 patients and I'm one of the larger ones around. Sure. Um, really, the goal is around 600 patients, but I, mm -hmm. I couldn't say no. <laughs> of course not. Um, you know, Mayberry, RFD. That's right. In a little That's way, right. you know, small you but know, it family. Is, you know, and I will say from a, from a physician standpoint or a provider standpoint in general, if you look at the statistics on burnout within within primary care especially, because it's a hamster wheel and it's very unsatisfying, um, we're able to practice medicine the way that, you know, the way that we wanted to when we were young, when we were idealistic, because we can spend time with people and, and talk to them on the phone. And, and, you know, somebody goes from the hospital, I'll, I'll sometimes give them a phone call at home and say, hey, tell me what happened and that type right. of stuff. I mean, doctors don't do that anymore, but I can because I have the time to do that and I don't have a huge uh, list of patients to keep track of. I've got, I know what's going on with my patients in general. And I know how... It works for the Gordons at home. We pay a certain amount every month for our entire family. But how does it work for small business or large corporations in the CSRA? You know, what we're trying to do is is to try and keep costs predictable. So the way that we set it up was $70 per employee per month. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if there's a spouse or a partner, it would be $60. And for any children true children not mm -hmm. you know 40 year old living at home uh the uh, <laughs> if the the uh, for them it would be 50 dollars per person per month and 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 that's the goal is to keep those costs but really again if you add that to what typical employers are paying for benefits it's so much less uh it is so much less and you're investing in something that will give access to care that'll decrease utilization of emergency room and and really honestly affect the cost of what's going on 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 the insurance side what's you know again we're playing defense we're we're there to answer questions we're there to try and keep the cost down and and again I've done it for 10 years it's not smoke and mirrors and and you're a patient so you can say no it actually works mm -hmm. and I'm going to jump onto that saying that you know Initially, when you say $70 per employee per month, that sounds expensive, right? But in reality, if we're a level-funded or a self-funded employer where we're paying the claims ultimately behind the scenes, $70 for one claim per month is, not, is nothing. Mm -hmm. If I see a primary care and they run lab work on me, we're talking that could be $1,000 in mm -hmm. claims. But if we run it through a direct primary care where there is no insurance, component to it we've eliminated a thousand dollars in potential claims dollars right. so it pays for itself it's not going to pay for itself necessarily year one but if we're proactively looking at a long-term strategy is what we should be looking at when we look at insurance this will pay for itself 10 times over year two three four right so this is a long-term play mm -hmm. to get data and get control of the claims dollars behind the scenes um, one thing that you brought up that I want to, to stress and talk about, because as a, as a consultant, I hear I have to have a good network, mm -hmm. right? I have to have a good network for my employees when they're traveling and they have to have access to care. Um, two things I want to ask about how direct primary care works when we're outside and we're mm -hmm. traveling and how your practice is solved for that. But two, I really want employers to understand that those outside claims don't happen very often. 
right? If we're traveling outside of our market and we need to see a physician, it's usually an emergency. Mm -hmm. And emergency care is covered mm -hmm. under your health insurance plan, regardless of where you are. Mm -hmm. um, but in reality, if it's a sinus infection right. or you know, pink eye or a cold and you're traveling, you usually suck it up until you get home or right. you have virtual, right? But I, I want to kind of let Rob talk about how we dispel this myth of direct primary care only works where right. you have access to the actual brick and mortar and how they've solved for it. Well, I mean, COVID was actually a really good example of that for us too, where people were not, they just weren't coming into the office and we were automatically set up to do virtual care, whether it was a video visit or whether it was a, a phone call or even just text messaging. But somebody comes in with sinus infection, the truth is most sinus infections you treat based on symptoms. You don't base it on the person's exam. And you base it on also some of the treatment you'll look and say, okay, what is the past history? What has gone on with this person? Well, for sinus stuff, we, we have pretty clear criteria and guidelines on how we handle it. And so if it's during office hours, it's going to come to my nursing staff and they handle it via protocol. So a sinus infection, pink eye, swimmer's ear, um, uh, you know, even, you know, somebody, uh, went to, I had one patient who on the weekend twisted their ankle and they were, should I go to the emergency room? They, they thought they broke their foot. Well, don't ever go to the emergency room for that kind of thing. Um, but truth is, I said, no, you just come in on Monday, and, and we ordered a very inexpensive x-ray. cost $40 to get the x-ray, um, and turns out she had a fracture in her foot, and I knew that we could just boot it. We didn't have to send her to orthopedics, mm -hmm. uh, and so we did that, uh, and then turns out she was younger, and I was like, why did you... It wasn't much of an injury, so we looked in and diagnosed her with osteoporosis or early osteo osteopenia. Osteo, uh, and, and so, again, it was because I had the time to look at things, because I didn't have two, 3,000 patients on my list, that was helpful. That's The same thing happens when people are out of town. They just send me a text message and say, hey, I'm out of town. I ran out of medicine. Can you send? I didn't bring it with me. Can you send it? And we do. You know, mm -hmm. we don't have a problem with that. Um, and, and there are times where we say, you know, this is more serious. I do think you should get to an, or an urgent care center uh, mm -hmm. in that type of stuff. Um, there is movement within the, the direct primary care community of because it's it's really exploded on the um, on, in the in in the United States uh, over the past 10 years. I was one of about 100 or so practices back when I started um, in, in 2013. Uh, and now there's, there's like 1,500 to 2,000 of, of those mm -hmm. practices. Um, if we can network with other direct care practices, I, you know, I think there's going to be more and more of that happening where people who are maybe away for a couple of months in New York or something like that, that we can arrange some sort of reciprocal agreement um, and the only other thing, actually, that, that is already in place is that if we do a contract with a business that, say, is in Augusta but is also in Greenville, Spartanburg, and also has something in Jacksonville, we have the ability to, to actually reach out to those mm -hmm. um, the, the practices in that area. Similar to your That practice. are similar to yeah. ours and have one contract that, that pays uh, whatever negotiated rates that, mm -hmm. that we have on that for all employees at all locations. Yeah, and Tom, it's uh, it, it's obvious how having an independent um, direct primary care provider is uh, so helpful in 2023. But where is the win-win in having an independent insurance provider? Yeah, the the win is we're not held uh, captive to using. Um, any one carrier, right? We're not dictated to write all of our business with Anthem or Aetna or United or Cigna or Humana. Uh, our ultimate goal is to provide the best cost of care with the best network and best access to care. And that hits, hits budgetary numbers for our employers. So um, we're not financially incentivized to put anybody um, with one carrier or the other, our ultimate goal as a consultant is to explain what's driving their costs 
and help them to control their costs in any uh, form or fashion. I think the ultimate area of where our business is going to go, and there was something we can get down in the weeds, and I promise I won't do that, but the the CAA, the Consolidated Appropriations Act, mm-hmm. really changed the way that our um, our industry is going to work. We now have to be completely transparent on our fees and how we're getting paid and and compensated. So that puts us in a position where we have to disclose what our compensation is. Mm -hmm. And if I'm ultimately keep putting you with an insurance carrier that gives you a 20% rate increase every year, well, I'm essentially getting a pay raise every year. Mm -hmm. Um, That's just not good business. If there's a better option out there that can save the employer money um, and ultimately control their costs, and I take a pay cut for that, I'm okay with that because then I've ultimately done my job and I can have that conversation with that employer of let's eliminate, let's eliminate my compensation from a um, percentage and let's just go fee based. That way we can eliminate this and make it a lot. See, right. you know, sounds more familiar. Reasonable, right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it does. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so how does it work where maybe welcome health does not have a service that they can provide for a patient? How does that flow into what you do? Well, so I think it works uh, hand in hand with mm-hmm. with my company understanding um, what's going on in their company, right? They we are aligned of what we're trying to accomplish, right? But ultimately, if I find a, a center of excellence that is willing to do a direct contract or does a good job of controlling costs and is transparent, and I can bring that to Rob and let Rob's team vet them out and vice versa. If Rob mm-hmm. finds a, um, you know, an imaging center, he's like, listen, you really need to talk to them because they're trying to change the game here. Right. As long as we keep that line of communication open and we're on the same page, we can ultimately control the cost or create a product uh, without going into too much detail. Cause I don't want to mm-hmm. at this point, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, there might be something in the near future where it, we, there are direct contracts and we are putting a quarterback in that now drives the, the care, right. Right? right? We are creating our vertical integration, but with independent right. providers that a are pro- not. A project manager in, in a development of something, if you will, some, a key person. That's right. right? Yeah, and I would yeah. say that, that healthcare, healthcare is so broken right now, and, and the, the, when I'm sitting in my office, it's not just about the system is broken. No, I see people who are getting harmed on a daily basis. Um, I, you know, I had a guy go into the emergency room with what I thought might have been gallbladder problems, and he walks into the emergency room at 8 a.m. or 7 a.m., and the first thing he hears is, you got a 13-hour wait. Whoa. That's the, and that's common. That's what we're seeing. And so... The healthcare system is broken. The, the costs are going up, yet the insurance companies are making more and more money. The hospital systems are making more and more money. Um, and direct primary care is gone hand in hand with, with, with other groups of, of folks who are starting to create, I like to call the insurgency, uh, where we don't, we want, we don't, we want to look in the mirror in the morning and not, feel ashamed of what we do. Um, I remember when I was in fee-for-service medicine and feeling like I could not give good care to anybody. And it wasn't, it wasn't my fault. I wasn't ashamed of myself, but I was just so fed up of working for a system that offered worse and worse care, both in quality of service and also in pure quality of health care. Um, and, and I know that there are insurance folks who are kind of doing the same. There's a group, there are several, several groups of these that are kind of going, going, going rogue themselves and saying, look, we're not going to be just these folks who are, who are shills for Blue Cross or, or, or United or whatever, that we're not going to do that because that's not the right thing to do. And we will stake our claim on saying we're going to fix part of this healthcare problem, the part that we are in control over and, and try and, and change things. And so, you know, I see Tom as a comrade in arms in some ways because he's, his goals are the same as mine, which is 
to run a business and make money, which all businesses try and do, but to do so in a way that is ethical and that has making healthcare better for employers actually at heart and not just taking advantage of a broken system and, and milking more dollars out of employers. And, and Tom, your version of what Rob is doing in essence is there are some of your clients that you will work a se- like self-insurance mm-hmm. too, which is, which is kind of similar. You pay as you go. Yep. It is the insurance market, just like the healthcare market in our CSRA is changing completely. It, this is not a newer concept um, across the country. Uh, Rob was a pioneer in it, so he was a forefront. But everything, and I've said this before, everything happens slower mm-hmm. in our market for some reason. It comes from the northeast down, the west coast over, hits Atlanta, bounces over Augusta, <laughs> and continues down, yes. right? Mm-hmm. So the self-funded movement is not a new concept. It's just a newer concept in our market. Um, The direct primary care model is not a new concept, but it's growing in our market. And it's an opportunity for employers to grab a hold of one solution of cost containment. Now, there's other aspects. We could spend hours talking about the pharmacy side. We absolutely <laughs> could, right? Maybe that's, maybe that's the uh, 201, 301, or 401 sure. class that yeah. we, we talk about. But to me, this is an easy solution to enter into controlling some of your costs. That's right. You may want to think about doing things a little differently in 2023. And they both have websites, but both um, have the time to sit and have consults because it's not transactional to them. And it's uh, welcomehealth.net, which is uh, Rob's website, and thepennantgroup.com for Tom. And uh, I feel like we've just had um, a healthcare summit. I love it. <laughs> one, one of many. One of one many, of many yeah. yeah. This is just the tip of the iceberg. The, the Both Tom and I, we can sit and talk about it. And, I mean, it really is – Healthcare is there's so many areas in which healthcare is is messed up and broken, and it it is so nice to be part of a solution. That's Maybe right. not for everybody in every circumstance, but at least pushing against that tide that is 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 harming, killing people, and also putting businesses under, making people go bankrupt. All of these things that that healthcare is 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 doing in such a bad way. Yeah. I think eventually you have to take the first step. Yeah. Right. So um, I heard a message at church last week Mm -hmm. about looking at 2023 in a rear view mirror, right? Hindsight's 2020, but what if we put ourselves in an imaginary position that says, Hey, if I want to change this and I also want to get to this point, what do I have to do to get there? Right? And the most important thing is to take action steps to get there. So if ultimately you want to get control of your health care spend or better health, you have to at least start somewhere. And I think that's just having a conversation, whether it's with me or with another insurance consultant, and then ultimately with a group like Welcome Health and understanding what they do and why it's important. Makes perfect sense. Well, gentlemen, thank you both very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for having us, Neil. Thank you. Neil.